I grew up in Pakistan and so most of my experiences have been really shaped by that time in Pakistan and my worldview on militarization, war and peace also is heavily imp impacted by that. So if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'd just like to relate my personal story a little bit. No doubt most of you are quite familiar with uh, 1947, the time when India and Pakistan divided from um, the Indian subcontinent and the death, devastation and murder that took place at that time. During this time, friend turned against friend, you know, family member against family member and neighbor against neighbor. And I've heard all these really heart-wrenching stories from both my grandparents and my parents. And one of the ones I particularly remember is uh, from my mother who told me the story of her aunts and grandfather who used to live on the Indian side of the subcontinent kind of traveling to Pakistan and how difficult that particular journey was. My um, great aunt was actually pregnant, so to avoid her being raped and murdered, she was put on the floor of the car with a heavy blanket. This is in like 46 degrees heat and 100% humidity. And when they actually arrived in Lahore, where my grandmother lived, my grandfather was in such a tattered and disheveled state that my uncle at that time who answered the door wouldn't let him in because he thought he was a thief or a beggar. But they were still one of the lucky ones because they actually made it alive to Pakistan, unlike thousands of others on both sides, practically, who were murdered. And the hostility that was set in stone at that time really led to three wars, 1949, 1965 and 1971, the latter of the two I experienced as a young child. And it was a bit difficult when I started thinking about what I would say here because I pushed all those memories really in the dark recesses of my mind. Some of them came back to me quite vividly. Um, the memories of blackouts, the memories of you know, sitting in trenches, of sirens blowing everywhere and hearing bombs going off during both those wars. I think one of my first memories actually is sitting in the lap of my mum in a trench in pitch dark with a pencil between my teeth and uh, cotton wool in my ears as bombs were blasting not too far away from us and also just planes going over, um, over our heads. But with these wars really came the militarization, the nationalization and the entrenchment of hatred pretty much between people who for thousands of years had generally lived in, in peace and now are always on the brink of war. Um, and both have massive nuclear capabilities now. But in living in Pakistan, it wasn't just those conflicts between Pakistan and India. In the 1980s, Pakistan became an ally of the US, uh, basically against the Russian invasion in Afghanistan. And I was at university at that time, I was just about to start university, and we all knew that there were billions of US dollars, as well as thousands of weapons <laughs> coming into Pakistan to train the Pakistani army and actually the Pakistani civilians um, to fight as Mujahideen against the, against the Red Army. This was really also the real start of the weaponization of just common citizens of Pakistan. You could actually buy AK-47s you know, from a street vendor at that time. And I don't think things have changed since. They only got worse. Um, two of my friends and classmates for u from university when I was in third year actually went off to this war to train as Mujahideen and never came back. And we all know that once the Russians left Afghanistan, it was mission accomplished for the US, but the death and devastation of the Afghanis continues on to this day. And it's just an intensified cycle of more military intervention one after the other. Militarism and war from Pakistan's example at least shows that it's not a way of resolving conflict. In fact, it actually makes things worse. Things like inequality and poverty and injustice and violence in society have all increased um, during the last 40 years. Pakistan is a country actually which has been under military rule for half of its 68 years of independence. That's about 34 years under military rule. And during this time, the culture has completely changed. Not only has the culture been militarized, but also the military has been politicized as well. And we cannot avoid facing the fact that this is inextricably linked with foreign interventions going back to the colonization of India. 
And there is much speculation, if you know of some of the events happening now in Pakistan with some you know, political aji-baji happening, there is much really speculation that, the, that those current events unfolding now are just the latest attempt of the military to again take control. I relate this story to you today because I think personally experiencing the reality of war is really quite different from hearing, seeing or reading about it in the media. And I do believe that Australia as a nation has really only experienced war from afar. Certainly successive federal governments have sent Australian troops overseas on multiple occasions. But aside from the violent European invasion of the 18th century, this continent has never been attacked directly except for the attacks in, on Darwin, of course, in 1942, which was over 70 years ago. So broadly speaking, as a society, we do not remember the psychological and physical damage of war on our home front. And non-Indigenous Australians, at least, have never experienced the savage trauma of invasion and occupation. We have memorials to remember our war dead, but as a nation, we have no real capacity to meaningfully remember how they died on foreign battlefields as part of minor military forces in vast, great wars. Only our veterans and their families, whose mental and physical health have often been neglected by our governments in the aftermath of war, truly know these conflicts. They know this in a personal and a painful way, suffering alone, distant from the majority of the rest of us. And I think it is this distance and abstractness of war that really affects the way we Australians relate to it, and therefore the tactics that we really need to think about when we are aiming to demilitarize our culture. War remains to us something that happens out there. Its consequences are always present in our news and our politics, but they're never quite that real. But politically and economically though, militarization is alive and well in our country, and we heard about it just then from Marilyn and Peter and also this morning. Tony Abbott's 24 billion expenditure on the purchase and maintenance of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters is the biggest single military expense in Australian history. Taking it into perspective a bit, 24 billion is roughly equivalent to the cost of free education in Australia for over a decade. Yeah, it is absolutely shameful. And I think one of the most obvious and most tragic for me anyway um, aspects of militarization is the military response um, to you know our sovereign operation sovereign borders and how the government has been kind of couching this in terms of border security rather than humanitarian responses. I think operation sovereign borders campaign is perhaps the most secretive racist and cruel application of Australia's immigration policy. Innocent people whose only so-called crime is seeking asylum to a safer country are turned back in the dead of night by our armed forces. And the rest, of course, are sent off to military-style camps to rot indefinitely. I think we've been kind of conditioned to accept that the military are useful in these situations where actually their presence is not required at all. I think physically, too, we continue to allow US military troops to be based on Australian soil and with large new influx of US troops coming to Darwin in the coming years, I think this is only going to increase and not slow down unless we act, and we act seriously. The ongoing militarization of our daily life is of course propped up by cheap symbolic tactics that aim to create a culture of fear. And that's a few examples of that have just happened in the last week. The language that infects our national discourse is a clear warning sign to the depths that we are sinking to, I'm afraid. The front page of Friday Sydney Morning Herald told us that Premier Baird wanted to hunt down Islamic threats. The Telegraph last week proclaimed that we must blow them to hell. It is really important to recognize that military interventions may seem to many like an intuitively natural thing to do. I think we have to recognize that if we want to move beyond that. And sometimes even to people who uh, favor peace. No one can deny the video footage of journalists being beheaded is extremely distressing. And it does elicit raw emotional response from Westerners who will inevitably ask themselves this question. What can we do to stop this? 
and it may even trigger violent and retributive thoughts. And our so-called leaders know that this is how many people react. And indeed, they themselves may react in the same way. So military intervention makes us feel like we're doing something. It is maybe cathartic in a little bit of a way, in the face especially of human rights abuses. And it makes sense at least in a reactive and very shallow way. Criticisms of the Greens and our opposition to this war is generally framed around in the following way. People often ask me, and I'm sure other Greens par parliamentarians and members as well, do you expect us to sit back and do nothing and let ISIS behead people? When the debate moves in this direction, we are seen as kind of the procrastinators, maybe the weaklings and the gutless, not wanting to act. And I think that's what really narrows down the choices for our society to just do military action or no action. Whereas we know that there are many options in between, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I think one of the real misfortunes is that both major parties are aligned in their pursuit of war. Just a few days ago, Tanya Plibersek, Labour's deputy leader, unconvincingly yet shamefully explained their support for war by writing, and I quote from what she wrote, in 2003, the objectives of our intervention in Iraq were flimsy. Today, the clear objective is to help the Iraqi government protect innocent civilians from atrocities. It's when debate is framed through these worldviews is when I think society kind of backs military action. I think the main issue with both the major parties is at the moment that they're too cowardly to admit that deploying forces, guns and bombs will not protect civilians. It is really just a way to cover their lack of leadership and courage. Leadership and courage at this time is about embracing that yes, this is a difficult problem, this is a complex problem, and we have to go down and address the root causes, not just keep putting band-aids and patching up some of the symptoms that we see at the moment. One practical level, we need to really, if we want to think about demilitarization of Australian society, we need to seriously reconsider the utility of the ANZAC Alliance and get US troops off Australian soil. Nothing, nothing good has ever come from their presence here. They only add to the vagueness of a perpetual military threat and serve no real purpose other than the pursuit of US interests. I just want to quote and, or talk a little bit about a speech that uh, President Dwight Eisenhower made in 19, um, made 53 years ago actually, when he left office in early 1961, and he warned of the total influence, economic, political, and even spiritual of the military industrial complex. The full economic and political manifestation of the perpetual threat and presence of war in society. And he said, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence of this complex, whether sought or unsought. So I might leave you with that and I'm really looking forward to a discussion on this and your views on what I as a state MP can actually do to move the debate from war towards creating peace. Thank you.